Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. We begin with the very latest on COVID-19. It's our pleasure to welcome back from UC Irvine School of Medicine, Professor of Medicine and Associate Medical Director for Epidemiology and Infection Prevention, Dr. Shruti Gohill. Dr. Gohill, very good Thursday to you. Good Thursday to you. Great to be back. Thank you so much. Let's start with the news of this morning uh, where TSA announced it's going to be extending the mask requirement for people in airports, traveling on airplanes, and on public transportation through April 18th. Does it make sense to you that that mask uh, requirement would be extended uh, uh, more than a month? Yeah, yeah, you know, it does. Listen, we've come off a huge Omicron wave. Um, We think that, you know, our prevalence should remain on a lower, you know, reaching a nadir uh, in the next couple of months. We really, really do. Um, But, you know, in order to make sure that uh, our calculations and everything that we have learned from the last two, three waves nationally or globally, you know, it makes perfect sense to me to take certain locations where people are packed in potentially packed in together in a crowded situation um, to just exercise uh, a bit of judgment. Uh, We've learned that masks work, and so let's put them on in in certain uh, scenarios, at least until we have a really strong sense that we have reached some type of stable prevalence and incidence. The CDC is reportedly looking into um, easing those requirements after April 18th. And what do you think they should be considering? And if if you were advising the CDC, what do you think they should keep foremost as they go through that process? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be, you know, all about what is happening locally and nationally on your incidence and prevalence. You know, listen, we're going in through real time. Um, right now, we're trying to, f- we're transitioning into a, a state of endemicity, which we all had anticipated would would happen. Being endemic doesn't mean that you're not going to have outbreaks, that you're not going to have a new variant, that you're not going to have, you know, potentially a serious variant come along. So during this transition phase, in the meantime, we have to open up. We have to move forward and we have to become a new society that deals with COVID like it did with influenza. And now with maybe more tools in our hands like oral drugs or, you know, in vaccination. So with all these layered uh, protection mechanisms that we have in place. If I were to advise CDC, absolutely, I'd be looking for stability in a local and uh, national group. So if you happen to be in a place where it's still persistent or you see a, a doubling or a rise, um, that you slap back on the um, the measures that we have learned work well. Uh, but if you happen to be doing great, uh, then you then then absolutely um, you know you you buy yourself more and more freedom. I would also um, I think the CDC probably has this top of mind <laughs> take into account the um, local uh, vaccination rate. Uh, it's clear that those communities that were heavily vaccinated saw much muted um, hospitalization rates uh, compared to those communities that didn't have it. So what we really don't want is to get into that ugly place where we crowded up our hospitals. And um, even as new outbreaks come along, if we can keep that um, tide from from happening, that's a huge deal. So, oh. I mean, I, yep. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... Uh... Break in. I was just going to ask how how can the CDC though honor those sorts of local differences because it sounds like they're looking at a universal nationwide policy that would deal with airplanes and airports and public transportation. Given that we're likely to see pockets where you have higher rates and other areas where it's low, uh, you know it's easy when every place is is struggling with COVID. 
I would think it's harder to come up with a national standard in transportation centers when it isn't, uh, you know, when, when it's not so easy to say everybody everybody is under threat. So how how did they do that? Yeah, I apologize. The nature of your question there. Now I get uh, where you were headed. Yeah, you're you're de- you're dealing with cross uh, communication across uh, regions. Um, and in that venue, I think my biggest piece of advice would be to maintain conservatism until we've seen uh, real solid, stable, uh, you know, rates across the nation. And so my anticipation would be that in very, um, in, in things, uh, in, in places like airplanes, um, you know, closed areas, uh, I think that the mask is not an unreasonable thing to do. I would probably advise to keep going with that until we know more in the fall. And in a sense, is it you have to set the standard because people are flying around the country. You have to set the standard for essentially where the risk is highest and and apply that on a national basis? That and the uh, relative unpredictability of when a new viral strain is going to come along and when, uh, uh, you know, any given individual coming from any uh, exposure they could have had uh, into a crowded space, you've just, there are too many factors to, to try to get control for. And I can see at the national level that you would take certain highest risk areas and apply uh, continued measures. I also wonder, Dr. Gohill, about um, just how the CDC takes into account what flyers are are willing to accept because you're, you're going to have differences. You know, some people who don't want to fly across country wearing a mask and others who will only fly across country if everyone yeah. is masked on the plane. How does the CDC take a person's individual comfort with or without a mask into account or does it? Yeah, I think I think similar to how it did uh, earlier, honestly, you, you know, at some point you have to set the stage, like you said, and you make a blanket statement. And then you have exceptions for the things that seem like a reasonable exception, like respiratory illness or, you know, some true medical exception. Um, and, and then, yes, in terms of comfortability, I do think there is, the, for example, in occupational health, we know that uh, people who, there are some people who just can't tolerate a mask, you know, they just have a really hard time with it. Um, and in the setting of a really heavy pandemic, we have to make certain uh, judgments. But other times, like when, when our prevalence is low, you can speak to the fact that, you know, for the most part, if somebody is truly getting anxiety or truly hyperventilating in the setting of a mask, that you could um, you could relax those standards. At the end of the day, I think what's going to happen is that it's going to be consumer driven. You know, I think the airplanes and the airline industry itself has its own workers to protect um, in closed spaces. And so that's why you've seen the standards come out the way that they have uh, and compliance come out the way that it has over the last year or so. We're talking with UC Irvine Medical Center professor and uh, expert on COVID-19 as she has been immersed in this for the past two years. Joining us on Air Talk, she's professor of medicine and epidemiologist by training, Dr. Shruti Gohill at UCI. We're at 866-893-KPECC, 866-893-5722. Or you can ask your COVID question of her at AT comments at KPECC. PCC.org. Please include your location and your first name. San Francisco is uh, dropping its vaccine uh, mandate, its proof of vaccination for public places uh, tomorrow. Many restaurants there say they're still going to be checking people's vaccination cards and making it their policy, even though there's no longer a city slash county policy in San Francisco. Los Angeles, similarly, is taking its first step towards lifting the vaccine verification requirements for many indoor businesses. That's not yet final, but it's anticipated the council will vote to do that at a future meeting. Dr. Gohill, your thoughts on your comfort level of going places if there isn't a vaccine requirement. Uh, Are you okay with that? And what sort of steps might you take yourself to protect yourself in those environments? Yeah, great question. You know, at, it's all for me, it's all about the numbers and the local prevalence. Right now, we happen to be 
in a sweet spot. Um, that doesn't mean you go out and, you know, uh, and, and not get vaccinated, not do all the things you need to do, but, you know, you're in a sweet spot. Yeah, we know that we're hitting a nadir and that the likelihood that we will encounter COVID in, an, uh, in certain settings, uh, you know, without a mask, that, that is what the only thing that is allowing our public health officials to feel comfortable in, and, and, of course, keeping our eye on the vaccination rate. We know it's sufficient. We know that there are enough boosters and there's immunity forgotten by Omicron. And so we are in this place where we think that the population, we're not dealing with a totally naive population like we did when COVID first hit. And so um, with the levels being this low, vaccination and immunity being higher enough, I actually would p- feel comfortable being out and about. Certainly outdoor spaces is a no-brainer, no mask for me. Uh, but in the indoor spaces, um, you know, I, I would treat a bar very differently than a sit-down restaurant, right? Um, I would, if it's a super crowded place and it's indoors and, you know, we've been to all places like that where the ventilation, you just know the ventilation is not that great. You know, I might slap on my mask. I'll keep my mask on me, uh, ready to use um, as needed, depending on the encounter. Also for me, if I'm going to a concert, say, where people are going to be yelling and, you know, is so enthusiastic, I might um, I might rethink that. Uh, you know, if you've got a bunch of people who aren't wearing a mask and yelling versus going to a classical concert where you won't be encountering that. Yeah, yeah, there's it. And uh, yeah, in a, you know, there are these classical concert venues that have also re- rehauled the way that they manage air, uh, let alone the fact that they are built for acoustics that allow for pretty good air dilution. Um, so you're absolutely right. These things are not um, they're not written in stone. They're about your your general calibration of your risk. Um, and that continues to apply. I happen to think that many of us have developed our own modicum of, you know, common sense of how we're going to handle different encounters. And I would say that until we you know, really look at this in the rear view mirror, we would continue those kinds of um, practices. What is, what is the um, end of COVID look like? Um, I, I was know. reading about some different <laughs> researchers and, you know, when we look at pandemics in the past, they've sort of wound down in different ways. Mm-hmm. And I was reading, it's not particularly well studied how pandemics ended. We have put much more emphasis, not surprisingly, into how they spread as to how they died off or, or became endemic. So do you, as an epidemiologist, um, Especially, do you do you have any thoughts about the likely way this sort of winds down? Yeah. Oh, gee. You know, this is the million dollar question for all of us in in epi and in COVID. And there are so many factors then versus now. You know, we have PCRs; they are highly sensitive. They'll stay positive up to ninety days. You know, muddling the picture of how we count disease and um, so many things to consider. We know that. You know, I, I think many, many of us have accepted that COVID, when we ca- talk about the end of COVID, what do we really mean? You know, uh, COVID's gone through its stages of being a pandemic, uh, causing outbreaks and being epidemic. And now, uh, with all of the layers of, of immunity that have been acquired either through real disease or vaccination, um, now we're in a place, I think, that uh, many of us are thinking of this as a slow roll towards low level. Uh, COVID transmissions at some point that, you know, does that mean we're not going to get another outbreak? Yeah, we're going to get an out- outbreak at some point, right? We're going to get just like flu. We get those every year, right? Um, and and we don't know how COVID's going to behave. It might be more than just a seasonal thing. We don't totally know. Um, so so with all of that, I think what we would look at is you know, rates of hospitalization, you know, rates of severe illness due to COVID. Um, would be, we'd keep our eyes on the incidence, uh, of course, but also rates of severe illness. And those two coupled together would help us understand understand, um, you know, whether or not we're dealing with a, a high-risk situation, not a high-risk situation. So I think that we will hit a point over the next four to five months where we will, you know, we'll be pretty stable. Then the winter season comes along because COVID is seasonal at some, to some degree, right? We know that. Is that because um, so, we go indoors more when the weather gets colder yeah. or, okay, it's not that so, the virus itself is more robust well, in cold weather, or do we know yeah. that? 
We don't totally know that, but but it is. It seems that it's more of the congregation aspect that you mentioned. Um, and uh, you know, if you're if you're uh, especially little kids, you know, um, and other other harbingers of uh, reservoirs, we we do know the coal virus also has some sort of predilection for uh, for less humidity actually, um, depending on the variant. Um, and then there are other things at, at play there. Physiological have to do with your um, the constriction of blood vessels and your airways and, and, and all of that and your ability to make secretions. And uh, all these things have been theorized. Nothing has been proven. Um, but we know forever that cold and flu seasons are, have a season. Um, and that if you have drier air and hotter air, that you might dry things up faster. So, all right. Yeah. Steve in La Cunada, along the lines of what we're talking about, tweeted, is there any reason to think we're not going to see another Omicron wave in the fall, particularly when natural and vaccine-induced immunity wanes? And what can we do to prevent that wave? Yep. So that's the question I think we have to ask our society. What are we going to uh, accept um, in terms of waves and prevention, and what can we do in response? Are we all going to get on board and do the do the thing at the right time? So, yeah, can there's nothing to say that we won't have a repeat wave. This will become our new norm. Add COVID to the list of viruses like RSV, you know, um, influenza, and many others that we see. Uh, and now, what we need to do is, as public health officials, for example, keeping an eye on all these positivity rates and the rates of hospitalization. You know, minute we see a signal, we put into effect, uh, you know, things like masking, things like, um, you know, public health messaging to stay uh, to, to to be vigilant about viral illnesses. And I think that over time, uh, this will serve us very well. And yes, we are going to see most likely, um, you know, if it's not Omicron, it's going to be something else. <laughs> but but uh, we will see another wave, I think. And, and it just the hope is the bump isn't as prolific as it has been. Dr. Gohill, thank you as always. We so appreciate your being with us on AirTalk, and we'll look forward to speaking with you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in LA. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at las.com, at kpcc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.